Hi, everyone. We're here today to talk about special education and distance learning. I'm very excited to be part of the uh, School Boards Association Workshop 2020. And I am here this morning with some very esteemed colleagues. I am Christine Soto of the law firm of Florio Perucci, Steinhardt, Capelli, Tipton, and Taylor. I am one of the co-chairs of the education practice, and I'm going to introduce you to our team and some very special guests this morning. Go ahead, Caitlin. Hi, my name is Caitlin Fletcher. I'm a partner in the education law group with Christine. And uh, this is actually the first firm that I worked at many, many years ago. And I am back now fresh out of the Department of Education where I work with the County Offices of Education and was a little bit more behind the scenes. So very excited to be back on the front line and what a time to be on the front line. Excellent. And full disclosure, Caitlin and I both worked at the DOE. I was the Executive Legal Affairs Officer. So we've been sort of taking a uh, you know, the best and brightest from the DOE to serve our clients. So Jackie, morning. Hi. Good morning or afternoon. Um, my name is Jacqueline Darminio. I am an associate with Florio Perucci, Steinhardt, Capelli, Tipton, and Taylor, um, and a member of the education practice group and a member of the sub practice group for special education. Um, and I'll also be your moderator for the discussion at the end of the presentation. Excellent. Excellent. So our law firm is one of the premier uh, New Jersey education law firms. We have a full practice. We have about 45 attorneys. We have various offices in the state. And I'm super excited today. I brought some very special guests from the law firm of Francic LLC in the state of Illinois, located in downtown Chicago. This is a premier Chicago law firm, education law firm practice. And I'm going to introduce you to Dana Fatori Cromley and Kendra Yoch. Go ahead, ladies. Hi, everyone. We're so happy to be here. Thank you so much for asking us to participate. My name is Dana Fatori Crumley. I'm a partner and one of the chairs of the Ed Law Practice Team at Franzic. Um, we're in Chicago, Illinois, right in downtown Chicago on Wacker Drive, um, which is a little bit of a different place now than it used to be, but soon to come back. And uh, we have a very vibrant special ed practice team of which Kendra, my partner, is a key member. Kendra? Hi, I'm Kendra Yock, also a partner at Frantic, and so happy to join you guys today. Thank you for inviting us and looking forward to our discussion. Awesome. So to begin today, we're going to just give everybody a framework of this presentation. If you've been to a Floria Perucci presentation in the past, we really do like it to be interactive and informative all at the same time. So this morning, what we're going to do, um, we're filming this morning, so we keep saying that. Um, we are going to really get into a deeper dive on compliance issues in special ed during a uh, remote learning environment. Um, the pandemic, COVID-19, is not canceled. It's alive and well, sadly, in many parts of the country. And we felt this was an excellent opportunity here at school boards to partner and collaborate with um, renowned education lawyers who are fully informed and uh, uh, of all the complexities of special ed and the challenges that not only we face as attorneys supporting our clients across the state, across the nation, but also uh, the challenges of our clients and the, the diverse school districts that we each represent. So we're going to let our guests um, to go first and sort of dive into some of these issues. Then we will take a crack at it. And then we're going to come together and have a very lively discussion on some very real issues confronting our clients today during distance learning. So just to get started, just a quick slide to introduce our whole forensic team here. Um, we are a, a team of a large team of people that practice solely in education law, and we do a variety of things, special ed, um, tenured teacher dismissal hearings, a lot of labor negotiations for Illinois public schools, because Illinois is a very labor um, intense state. The unions, we have two major unions that we deal with, the IFT, which is the Illinois Federation of Teachers, and of course the IEA, part of the NEA, the Illinois Education Association. So practice, a very broad practice range. So one of the, um, we've been following this whole, all the changes with COVID-19 um, throughout this pandemic, and we have us, lots of ways that we do that. One of them is through our Special Ed Law Insights blog, and Kendra has a big role in that, so I'll let her explain it a little bit further. 
Sure. So we try to, you know, stay on top of the new developments. And right now that means a lot of information about COVID. You can see our most recent post here is about the recent guidance from OCR and OSA. Um, so there is uh, some national content because IDEA obviously is a law that applies across the country. Um, and then there's some that's specific to Illinois, uh, but you might want to check it out. The website is available there on the screen. So remote learning plans uh, are something that are not required in Illinois, but a lot of our districts are using them. Uh, basically, they outline how the student's IP or 504 plan will be implemented during remote learning, as well as during uh, any sort of hybrid time where schools are doing, you know, maybe two days in person and three days remote, um, and kind of what is that IEP implementation going to look like when we're not in the classroom where, you know, the IEP was written to be implemented. Uh, and the way that most of our clients are doing this uh, would be to have the case manager working and collaborating with the other team members to figure out what adjustments need to be made. Um, are there particular accommodations that are going to look different, right? Preferential seating maybe doesn't make sense, uh, but maybe a student is going to need a little bit more in the way of executive functioning and maybe some visuals to support their schedule when they're in a remote setting. Um, so there might be some changes to accommodations. Uh, the way we measure goals might look a little bit different in a remote setting, uh, and some goals might actually look different. You know, I'm thinking specifically about things related to physical therapy, orientation and mobility um, are really hard to do in a remote setting, and so those might look different. Uh, and so this plan outlines those differences, and then is typically incorporated into the IEP via an amendment. So it becomes part of the IEP. It doesn't replace the IEP, right? So when uh, hopefully in the near future, we're able to come back into the school environment, that regular IEP remains in place for that student to provide faith. And we found uh, that our clients, it's helpful because it increases communication between the school and the parent, so everybody knows what to expect. Uh, there's not confusion or uncertainty about what this is going to look like in this very different environment. It also helps obviously with documentation. As attorneys, we are all about documentation. If it's not written down, it probably didn't happen. Mm -hmm. um, and then implementation, right? Obviously, one of the things we're concerned about in special education is making sure the IEP uh, is implemented, uh, it is a legal document. Uh, and so we do have concerns if we don't have this sort of amendment or addition and the IEP is not being implemented, there's some legal exposure there. And then additionally, the parent gets their procedural safeguards so that if they don't like the remote learning plan, they have a way to challenge that that's laid out. It's all very clear and it's something that's familiar to them. So this next slide really hits on a theme that I know Christine and I have discussed repeatedly is that there is no, no relief, even though we're in a pandemic and education has drastically changed for most students across the country. There is no um, exception to the requirements of IDEA. So whether you're in a remote learning setting, if you're in a blended learning, if you're back to school on a reduced schedule or an alternate schedule to permit social distancing or, uh, uh, or facilitate other you know, COVID-19 requirements, you still have an obligation to provide FAPE, still have an obligation to meet the fundamental requirements of IDEA. None of those obligations have been altered or relaxed. So it's important to be very creative and flexible and keep working towards meeting students' IEP goals in whichever way that you can. Okay, so here in Illinois, our State Board of Education has um, given some guidance to, to districts uh, that they prioritize in-person instruction for special education students, English language learners and other at-risk populations. Um, and a lot of the school districts in Illinois have been working to, as they make plans to come back into in person, uh, make sure that they are bringing some of their kids with IEPs or more significant needs in first or for additional in-person instruction. Whether there's a right to that in-person instruction, I think is a much trickier question, right? I don't think that that's laid out anywhere as such. There is a right to FAPE though. And so for some kids, uh, certainly we've heard arguments from parents that the only way for them to get FAPE is in person. Uh, and that's a complex question that you're gonna have to look at on a case by case basis and figure out, you know, what can we do in the remote setting and how can we make it work for that particular student and their individual needs? Um, and then, you know, at what point is it safe? You know, how do we balance the need for FAPE and the need obviously for the safety of everybody involved? 
um, for that student to start coming back into the school environment to get that um, direct instruction from teachers and related service providers. And then that accommodations are required for students who are unable to follow safety protocols. Also in Illinois, we have a requirement that everybody is wearing a mask in the school building. Certainly we have some students who, um, you know, there is a medical or disability related reason why that is difficult or not possible. And so we're looking at ways to accommodate those students, ways to, um, if possible, teach them to wear a mask, right? Wearing a mask is a skill. There's a, a desire to have kind of a yes or no, like you can't wear a mask, you can't come to school. And I don't think we can have that sort of bright line rule. We've got to be working through this uh, and using our IEP teams. Right. I mean, I, I think I've noticed, especially from maybe people in the school that are not directly involved in the delivery of special education services a lot, and I don't want to call out the superintendents, but some of them just want to say, I just want to be able to say that if you can't wear a mask, you can't come to school. And that is just not a, a permissible sort of position to take. You have to go through the process. We've been advising our clients to go through the IEP process. And I, I am happy to report that in many cases, or in, I'd say most cases, we, we are successful in getting the students to wear masks because this is not something, as we know about IDEA, we're not just teaching kids so that they can attend sixth grade, we're teaching kids so that they can finish school and be a part of our you know, society, work, contribute, and, you know, right now, wearing a mask means that's part of being in society. So it's a great IEP goal, and that's how you approach it. So the other big challenge in Illinois is just getting back into school and how school looks different with all the, the pandemic safeguards that must be put in place before you resume in-person instruction. And in Illinois right now, um, we've got about 31% of our districts, I believe, is the last statistic I saw, that are fully remote. They are not back in school at all. There are no students coming into the buildings. Teachers aren't coming into the building. They're teaching from home, just as you see us all giving this presentation right now. We have about 42% that are half and half, where they may have those school buildings open for about half the students in the morning, half in the afternoon, in order to allow for social distancing. And then there's some that are in mostly um, less populated areas of the state that are back full time, but with all the safety precautions in place. And one of the one of the things that you have to overcome in order to get school started again are the labor issues. So in Illinois, the teachers in the school districts are represented by labor unions, and there is a statute that governs um, labor issues for educational employers. It's called the Illinois Educational Labor Relations Act. And it requires bargaining on mandatory subjects. So one of those is obviously working conditions. And working conditions are vastly different under the pandemic. In many ways, a special ed lawyer is an important part of the bargaining team because staff members that are coming back first, as, as Kendra talked about, are often special educators. And what do they need to do their jobs? And what are they demanding to do their jobs before they return to the classroom? So it's been, that's been something that has been a main focus here in our state and getting school back started. So what are the things that actually they bargain in special ed? And I think this is, you know, what probably other people have been experienced. PPE, and you know, there's legal issues around all of these, which I'm sure all of, our, all of the lawyers here have discussed. The setup of the classroom, if you are gonna have people back, um, hazard pay. Some people are asking, some unions are asking for hazard pay. Well, how do we educate a student that can't wear a mask, for example? What if the student only can wear a face shield? And is there hazard pay that's associated with giving that student instruction? Um, remote instruction. And we saw this when we started. Like, how does that impact? Like, how much time do we have to be on camera? How much time are we doing more off camera? Um, on the side communications. Workload issues, especially for related service providers like um, social workers and psychologists and counselors who are providing mental health services. As we see issues arise in that area, I know that's a concern of everyone in the country about how this is impacting children's mental health. And sometimes that res results in increased workload for those staff members. And then of course, being recorded. Um, I know that before the pandemic, teachers were very 
hesitant to be recorded. And now we're in a situation where they can be recorded at any time. Someone can take a screenshot, someone can record part of a lesson, and it may be surreptitiously where the teacher's not even aware of it. So all of these things, the union is very um, focused on before they return. They want answers, they want a plan, they want this all pre-thought out and pre-arranged um, before they're they're coming back into the classroom to be with children. So another issue that we've all been confronting is how to get evaluations done. Um, like we've mentioned, there has not been a waiver of any of the requirements under IDEA, and that includes the timelines that we have established to do our evaluations, both initial evaluations and uh, re-evaluations. <clears throat> so how do we get those done? And what we found with our clients is that um, really, you know, working with that team to figure out what makes sense for a particular student and their reevaluation. So some things can certainly be done in a remote setting, um, interviews, rating scales, um, observations of the student doing remote learning, uh, that can be a, a, a helpful piece of information to gather, uh, as well as records reviews. Those are all ways that we can collect information to determine if a student is eligible and then what type of services they're going to need. Um, you know, formal testing may or may not be able to be administered in a remote way. And I think it's important to check with the test publisher, uh, to look at what are the requirements and do they have provisions for doing it remotely um, and having it still be a valid assessment that gives an accurate uh, assessment of the student's skills. Um, and that is an idea requirement that we, we make sure that we're testing in a way that is valid and reliable. Um, so there are some things that you might be able to do in person now, right? It might be safe to do a one-on-one -on -one assessment uh, with masks, distancing, you know, that might work for some instances. And then there are some things that really like can't be done until we are back in person. You know, I'm thinking about like an FBA, you know, how a student is interacting with classmates uh, in a physical classroom setting is just going to be difficult to collect at this point. And so then it's really a team decision, you know, do we need this right now? Can we have an agreement to do that, you know, and however much time when we're back in the school building and making sure that all of those decisions are documented so it's clear that there was sort of that meeting of the minds and everybody's on the same page um, about what the plan is, right? We could finish our evaluation for now and make a determination and then open it up again when we're back in school if we're seeing different needs or um, that additional information would be helpful in getting the programming uh, for the student to be appropriate. Um, so I think it's kind of a fluid process figuring out how to get these done. Um, and if you, know, if you are gonna agree to an extension or some sort of change, making sure that those are all documented again as we lawyers like to focus on. Mm -hmm. So just wrapping up here, um, the confidentiality concerns that are just uh, you know, in remote learning when uh, you know, you're on the screen and students are on the screen and we have parents going about their business and every, you know, maybe they're in the kitchen, maybe they're in the dining room, maybe they're, you know, learning from a very small space with other people in it that have nowhere else to go because people are not able to go to work or go to school, their siblings aren't able to go to school. And obviously teachers are very hesitant about providing services in that, in that way, um, especially related service providers. We've had a lot of concern about, you know, do we need any special consent form you know, I'm going to be doing my social work minutes via Zoom or via WebEx and what rules apply to that. And, you know, in, in Illinois, at least, there, this is the same as once you provide consent for services, there's consent. Um, you're providing the service. You do not need a special consent. We've been providing parents notice and with just reminders that, you know, this is related service time. There's going to be other students on there. You shouldn't be lingering in the background. Um, and, you know, to just, and for the most part, it's gone very well. We've had a few things of things being posted on Facebook. Luckily, it's been most, mostly math class or something like that and not someone's related service session. But you have to just be ready to handle that in a case by case basis. HIPAA, we have the HIPAA X through because HIPAA does not apply to this. People think HIPAA applies to everything. I don't know if that's a problem you guys have in New Jersey, but in Illinois, people are constantly raising HIPAA where it has no business being raised. <laughs> so thanks so much for letting us sort of give you our bird's eye view of what's happening in here in the Midwest and 
We look forward to our discussion on some of these issues later. A lot of what you laid out is exactly what we're dealing with and sort of the approach we've been taking for our clients here in New Jersey um, regarding uh, all of the challenges of being in a remote space. So, um, I, I, you know, we are really very much on the same page and we didn't even talk about that level of uh, a detail in preparing for this, but absolutely, I know that our audience is really gonna get a lot of benefit out of what you just laid out. So thank you, but Caitlin, feel free to chime in. Oh, no, I agree. And I, as I'm just thinking about my slides coming up, I think a lot of my comments are going to be, you know, as Dana and Kendra said, and we're seeing very similar things in New Jersey. So with that, why don't we go into our um, presentation on the landscape of special ed and the challenges we've been dealing with here in New Jersey. Our practice group, uh, very similar to Francic, I think we, we might be your... Uh, sister group out here in New Jersey. Uh, two co-chairs to the education practice group, myself and Lester Taylor. We have Caitlin Pletcher and Afshan Edmiri Hiner who are partners in our group. And then we have uh, several associates at well who work on the gamut of issues from special ed to labor issues, to negotiations, to other public entity work. So I think we, we as well cover the similar type of landscape that you guys do out in Chicago. And then more specifically, I'll introduce you to our subgroup of special ed attorneys. Um, right here, we are a dynamic group. Um, some of the other education attorneys do uh, get special ed assignments. I really feel like when you talk about education in any, um, any of its facets, you really have to have a working knowledge of special ed, as you ladies pointed out in labor. It's very important to have a good basic knowledge. So um, while this is our core team of special ed attorneys, I do circulate around the office so that um, as people approach other aspects of education law, they have a good familiarity. So we'll just dive right in now to where we are in special ed and distance learning. Okay, so again, here, here I am going to start that as, as Dana and Kendra <laughs> said, but no, you said it beautifully that uh, FAPE still applies remote or not remote. And FAPE means that students with disabilities are entitled to receive an educational program that confers meaningful education benefit, um, home or in school, wherever you are. And the focus is still on what's appropriate for that specific student. Doesn't matter where where you are learning, but it still has to be tailored to that student. Still has to be what's in the IEP and being provided, you know, remotely to the greatest extent possible. So the challenges, the challenges of distance learning on schools and students. Um, I'm going to briefly touch on um, for schools to since you both just recently talked about the the labor issues and the issues from the union. We're seeing all of those same issues. And then just to add on one more context, we were seeing a lot too for um, teachers who were required to go to school because the, we're not, they're not doing remote, um, an accommodation request to work from home. And what we've been helping a lot with is engaging that interactive process with the teacher. Like what is the basis for, for this accommodation request? And let's break it down. How else can we provide this accommodation without you being at home? So to that labor piece, that's just one other layer that we're also seeing. Um, also with school, uh, lack of resources and going to equity and the equity gaps. When this all started in March, um, stuff that you, you don't necessarily think about, but when everybody went remote, does every household have internet access, let alone even having a Chromebook or, or a device to log on remotely? And what we were seeing were some districts who were sending children home with dittos versus other districts that were one-to-one -one with each student having a Chromebook. The New Jersey Department of Education actually is using some of its funds from the, uh, the CARES Act to have a Bridging the Digital Divide grant money, which is going to districts to use money to provide hotspots for students and provide laptops and other devices so that all students who are home can participate and have access to their education up and down and across the state. Christine and I were just working on an issue with the district recently where student right now is displaced in a hotel and the internet access was not strong there and 
district is out there getting that child a hotspot so that he could participate. Um, the other issue, protecting the safety of children, not only if there are students who now are home who are not typically home and what's going on in the home. Also in talking to some of the county offices of education, they are finding that some students who are not logging on, not entering their work, we're not sure where those students are. So another issue that I haven't really thought about, but is coming up now in this in this remote life. For students, again, touching on a lot of the issues already brought up, but the, the lack of structure, the having class at your kitchen table and who's behind you and are your parents chiming in and are your other siblings chiming in? Are you and your 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 siblings sharing one device and who's on when? And also, does a family member have COVID? Just the anxiety of everything that's going on in the world right now, our students are all dealing with that. Finally, you know, like for, for all of us adjusting to remote life, that in person is always, you know, you've got that peer to peer interaction, um, your coworker to coworker interaction in person, and we're just missing that right now. And just to chime in, uh, Caitlin, I do think that the social emotional learning has been a big focus here in New Jersey and part of the road back and the, the NJDOE's reopening guidelines is to put an emphasis on that social and emotional learning for students because we recognize um, when the lights went dark down in, in March that students have been really impacted in that capacity. So um, equity, I think, and social and emotional learning are two big things that we're, we're addressing globally here in New Jersey. So the challenges of distance learning on attorneys uh, as Christine and I keep saying, we are flying the plane as we're learning to fly the plane. There's just new guidance coming out left and right or no guidance. <laughs> sometimes when we think or we hear that it's coming and we're just, you know, sometimes making it up as we go along and figuring out what, what works and how we can help and then see what comes out next. Uh, but it is, it's ever changing. A lot of what we're seeing also with due process complaints or parents just raising this, students who have always had in-district programs, but now that they're home, parents then jumping to, well, then we need an out-of-district placement. And it's not necessarily that jump, your program is still based on your needs. Just because you're remote doesn't mean that you jump to out-of-district placement instead. And I think the big push on that is that we have school districts that are fully remote, teachers home. We have school districts where teachers are coming in, but students are out. We're still in this first marking period where, where people are hoping at the beginning of November to go hybrid. Some school districts are hybrid, some are fully back, and some of our added district placements are in person. So while I understand a parent's desire to have that in-person instruction, as Caitlin very accurately said, it's been not necessarily based on the, uh, the needs of the student because we are trying to meet those needs to the greatest extent possible through the remote learning, but it's not automatic that you're just going to go out because, frankly, you can go to that school where they're in person and the next day there's a COVID scenario and they close for two weeks. So that's, that's sort of the challenges. I, I really do appreciate a parent, um, and I do want to say to the teachers and parents out there, we, it does not go unnoticed the challenges that we're all under. But as lawyers, we're trying to stay focused on the legal aspect of things and relying collectively on our my 20 years plus experience in special ed. So while we are learning, as I do like to say, learning to fly a plane as we're flying, we have a lot of um, collective expertise in special ed and it's still very challenging. Mm -hmm. And that's where, you know, staying abreast, it's, it's Christine has um, so many subscriptions to all these services and she has been great about sending out group emails that this just came out and maybe in California, but Kendra, has, as you mentioned that IDA is federal. So it's interesting just seeing what is going on across the country. And even as our conversations with you and Dana about this, but just anything that's coming out right now, whether it's guidance or cases um, is helpful just to, to see it, how somebody is addressing it um, is very helpful. So uh, the New Jersey Department of Education, they issued a restart and recovery plan for school districts to follow as they were developing their plans to reopen. And it included uh, many, many components, I believe 10 required components for the reopening plans. There was one section about special education and they had some recommendations including to create procedures to address students with physical and health impairments, 
review IEPs to determine whether the pandemic negatively impacted critical skills. This, this next one, I mean, data is always so important. We always are looking at data to see what are our students' needs, what needs to be changed in the IEP, but especially now in these circumstances, considering the impact of, of missed services and how to address them and just always, always assessing and always, you know, looking at what's going on with our students. Also to provide assistance if post-secondary plans were adversely impacted because of the pandemic. One that applied this summer was to implement extended school year programs to the greatest extent possible if those programs were already included in the IEP. So um, just looking at some of the challenges that we've already identified, and then we're gonna get into a, a discussion about whether what's true and not true as we, we understand it. We are all obligated to follow the timelines under IDEA. There's been no relaxing except in the area of preschool. Here in New Jersey, the Department of Education has given a framework or guidance up to the greatest extent possible, but for lawyers, what exactly does that mean? It's almost the same a kind of analysis as FAPE. What's a free appropriate public education? What's appropriate to a school district may not be appropriate to a parent. So I think to the greatest extent possible is going to mean different things to different people and should always be individualized to the student. There should never be a blanket, we don't do group PT, um, it should always be to the greatest extent possible and also individualized to the students. And I think that's, if we go back to the basic tenets of special ed, it'll help us plow through some of these, these issues. The next one is IDEA timeframes. They're all the same here in New Jersey, except for part C. Um, the challenges, as you've all highlighted with the evaluations, what assessments can be done remotely, what are the publishers permitting, what does your licensure permit. So all of that has to be taken into account. But I know uh, for the school districts that are watching this, many that we've talked to have been very, very creative about looking at the data that they have and try to find a way to either deal with an initial referral or a reevaluation and, and move it forward as opposed to just you know, sitting back. So here in New Jersey, when, when COVID broke in March, there were some people taking the position that, well, if you need a waiver, you have to waive before we're gonna implement this IEP or give us uh, express consent to a group related service online with all the confidentialities. And just as in Illinois, uh, the Department of Education came out on April 30th and kind of put that issue to rest and said there can be no barrier to the access of special education, which makes sense, right? As you noted, when the parent consented to that IEP, they consented to those services. The implementation of those services don't require an additional consent. Where I think it's interesting is in the FERPA, because there is affirmative consent if they're going to be put in a situation where personal identifying information may be disclosed um, to a third party, unless you fall into one of those exceptions as a school official or these platforms like Zoom, um, also as a school official or a directory information. So that's where we get into trouble is that people see that notice that we've done as well. Hey, by the way, this could be problematic or a, a, an ask for a consent for FERPA, that is where people have gotten a little confused on the issues. Moving on to the implementation of the IEP to the greatest extent possible, we need flexibility in services, always an individualistic approach. We really are collaborating with our districts and parents. Obviously, we can have remote IEPs. We've gotten over that hurdle. I think the challenge here is the distance learning plans that you guys have mentioned. For the clients that we're working with, we are, because of this framework of greatest extent possible, the IEPs are written for the brick and mortar. Where we run into an issue with remote, districts are having IEP meetings and making those amendments on, but there has not been, to my knowledge, at least with the clients we work with, a sort of a movement, everybody go in and do a distance learning plan. Um, it's not required, but it's not prohibited either. So I think the interesting thing here in New Jersey, the longer we remain remote, is that something that New Jersey school districts want to um, consider to just document what exactly they're doing in this remote setting. Um, I think the feeling is, well, we're gonna be back in the building in two weeks or we're hybrid. So the challenge of doing a distance learning plan, I think is that 
it changes. And so what works today, if we go hybrid, now that doesn't work. So I think there's sort of this gray space where we're not really sure how the courts are going to be looking at that ultimately to determine if we provided that student FAPE. And the other challenge, I think, is change in placement. When you're remote, do you get your stay put for in-person? And we've seen some cases coming up across the, the nation. We'll go to provision of related services. A lot of these related service providers also have their own licensing boards that have their own directives. You should always check with them. But here in New Jersey, there was an executive order from Governor Murphy, which allowed for telehealth and telepractice from... so. The Department of Ed actually in 2019, August of 2019, if I have my date correct, had actually said no telepractice for related services in the state of New Jersey. So they had to come back on April 3rd of 2020 and put in an emergency regulation to change that. So again, it's moving at warp speed, everything is evolving and we're trying to stay abreast of all of these changes, but for your remote service, um, your related service providers who are working remotely, always stay in touch with your licensing board, the DOE. And we have to make the distinction between telehealth, which is a speech pathologist or physical therapist in the health capacity versus in the educational capacity, because you answer to dis different people in the educational capacity, right? We have the guideline from the NJDOE and always health and safety of students and CDC guidelines are always kind of the buck stops with them because with our, let's say more urban clients or even suburban clients with older facilities, physical plant, how do I bring in my 500 special ed students and also maintain the social distancing you know, and, and follow those CDC guidelines? PPE is, <clears throat> you know, we can get that. We know what that looks like. I think it's sometimes physical plant that makes it difficult for a speech pathologist who runs a group of five students in a, in, a, in a speech office that you can't maintain social distancing. So now we move it to the cafeteria. Now there might be other competing interests in the cafeteria for other groups. So these are the real life challenges and we're here to support our clients and, and sort of help them power through it. Let's go to the next slide. And Caitlin, I'll let you talk a little bit about sort of just the overall need of special ed in New Jersey. Um, we don't have stats today on who's remote hybrid because literally it's a daily change of numbers, frankly. So, but go ahead, Caitlin. Yeah, we just want to provide a, a quick snapshot of the, of the landscape of special education in New Jersey. And these stats are as of 2019, but there were seven, almost 18% of students who are classified, 9% are classified as autistic, and 20% um, other health impairment as some of the classifications. Placement wise, there's about 44% who are with the general education population for more than 80% of the time. 28% spent less than 80%, but more than 40% with the general education. And about 15% spent less than 40% with the general education population. Right. So the fact, oh, let me see, the point is that we have a lot of special education students in the state of New Jersey with varying needs. Mm -hmm. And as we phase back from remote into hybrid, you know, uh, it'll be interesting to see that new OCR guidelines that came out on the 28th of September, just saying all MD students are back first. You really can't do that. You have to have an individualized look because there could be a student with dyslexia who requires in person and actually they should be also back first, right? So the challenge is, and, and in order to do it legally, you have to always be having a, an individualized assessment of each student. And finally, for our last slide, just some best practices, which we've been weaving in and out uh, through this presentation. So we will be able to get to our fact and fiction soon. because I know we, we have touched on many of these, uh, but communication being key, you know, just at an IEP team meeting where the teacher was saying, you know, with, with Microsoft Teams now, yes, we are remote and it's not the same as in person, but the, it also gives you this added access where this teacher said she just kept Microsoft team bombing the student and just going in and calling him and calling him and trying to figure out what was going on and why he was not participating. Uh, tailoring based on individual community and student needs. Uh, Christine just brought up a great point with, with districts, depending on the setting, some, some urban districts with the older buildings that were already overcrowded pre-pandemic and sometimes in, in person may just not be possible 
at the moment or, you know, hybrid, just it, it varies depending from district to district. Staying abreast as we keep emphasizing because everything keeps changing and we get more guidance as we go on and we see more in real time and see what's working and what's not working. And then again, just to end on, um, you know, monitoring at a national level and how great it's been to collaborate with a law firm in Chicago and hearing there's stuff that when we were meeting that you were telling us about that, you know, we thought was so interesting. And it's, it's been great just to hear what's going on in other states. And to that end, let's get to it, Jackie. Let's throw some uh, factor fictions out there. Uh, we have a bunch so we can move around. I, I think we got another half hour. So let's just dive in, pick one and Throw it out to the floor. See. Okay, well, let's start at the beginning and see what we, where we jump to. So the first fact or fiction, it is a FAPE violation if a student is not provided compensatory education for missed services during distance learning. This is going to become very important as more and more schools start to go back into the physical school building. So does anybody know fact or fiction or is it one of those it depends moments? I'm gonna defer to our invited guests. Um, and, you know, always guests go first, so go ahead. So I would jump in and, and say, no, not necessarily, because uh, I would frame it a little bit differently. Um, compensatory education is not part of IDEA as far as something we're obligated to provide. Instead, it's something if the district doesn't provide FAPE, then a court might order you provide compensatory education to make up for that. And we can and should proactively, if we recognize that a student didn't get their services, if remote services really just were not meeting their needs, we were not seeing any progress, then absolutely proactively going in and offering some additional services to make up for that time when the student wasn't making progress, wasn't getting what they needed, absolutely makes sense and can help protect you from those due process complaints and lawsuits that might lead to additional um, awards of compensatory education or other uh, results. Uh, so I would recommend doing this, but I, I wouldn't frame it as there's not a FAPE obligation to provide it. You provide it if the student didn't already get FAPE. And, and I'm, I really love that distinction. And we framed it this way for exactly that purpose, because I think people think, oh, um, you denied me FAPE. It's a FAPE violation if you don't give me X. And really, comp ed is a remedy for the FAPE violation. And that's exactly what you just said, a potential remedy. So here in New Jersey, what um, we're seeing is we're talking about unfinished learning just across the board for our gen ed students, even our special ed students. So um, there is a movement right now to do it, a formal assessment of what is that unfinished learning. Um, I'm, I'm hearing something called Start Strong. If they do this assessment, it may give us some objective data of what a student did not get or didn't get. Because my understanding of the remedy of comp ed, if there is a FAPE violation, is that it's not hour for hour. It's going to be what the student needs in that moment of time. I think this is what some school districts don't understand and definitely sometimes what parents don't understand. If you get your IEP calls for three individual speech and you didn't get three individual speech during COVID or during the pandemic and remote learning, that does not mean three speech X weeks, I get it. Right. So what a tool. I think it's interesting. I'm wondering if in Illinois, you've heard any movement towards a formal assessment geared towards identifying the unfinished learning that students have during this remote time. So I think we're very similar to you is that we haven't heard of a formal assessment that's going to be implemented, but there's definitely guidance from our State Board of Education that when we do have kids coming back to in person instruction that we do do some inform and, um, informal and assessments to inform educators as to what was missed, what needs to be, um, what skills need to be revisited so that they can move on to the next uh, grade or the next level. But that's been an across the board thing. And we've just been recommending it to clients as well in the special ed setting. But it's something that you need to do sort of continuously. You know, it is not an hour for hour thing, but if you start to see a decline or a student like being very, is, their progress is stagnant, that's the time to come in and make it up, not to wait until the parent, you know, 
makes the claim. So it's good to be sort of on the offensive here rather than on the defensive, and that's by using data to monitor progress continuously. And I think you make a great point because one of the things as you, I think Kendra, you, you really identified was documentation. So throughout the pandemic and from March, and Jackie, you were involved in a lot of our trainings, we, uh, really strongly urged our clients to document. And to the extent you could document what a student received, what um, the greatest extent possible meant for that individual student uniformly, it will help us make this comp ed. Because the direction was from the state, start thinking and making those comp ed assessments, but based on what? So you have to have that data. You have to also assess where the student is today. And I'm wondering, what your what your opinion is if the parent chose not to do it not to have the assessment or rather not have the related services themselves it was an election of the parent i don't i don't have time for that or i don't want group pt right now would you say that the districts would owe comp ed under that situation i think if the district made it available then they've got a good argument that they don't owe comp ed um, i would still encourage the team to look at you know, what is the student's present level now and make sure they have a good understanding of that so that the just IEP services that are being recommended meet the student where they are right now, which might be different from before if they've had an extended period of time without that service. A lot of our clients have taken the position that if a parent says, you know, I'm working, it doesn't work for me right now, it's not the equivalent of a denial of service. That's different. Denying a service means I don't want it, I'm not consenting, I, I don't want it, right? This is more, I can't do it right now, but when you come back into the building, it's still part of the IEP. So it's a difference. I think districts that are out there, be mindful that of the realities of remote learning and parents' ability to comply, and that doesn't mean it's I'm, I'm not providing consent or I'm actually denying a particular service. It may be come back to me in a week until I figure it out or till my internet, you know, I get the hotspot from the district. So that I just wanted to make the distinction between denying services and, you know, uh, uh, refusing or, or just saying I can't do it right now. So let's take another one. Sure. Staying on uh, FAPE. Let's go to this one. It is a denial of faith if a school district attempts to provide virtual services, but the services are not appropriately tailored to the student's individual needs. Is that an automatic denial of faith? Is there something school districts can do to compensate for that? Anyone want to take it? Caitlin, you want to take it? Sure, and I, I think it goes to a lot of what we've been talking about is that it, it could be everything, whether we're remote or in person, you know, student services always should be appropriately tailored to the student's individual needs with this implementation of the greatest extent possible you know i think a lot will come into play if faith was actually denied or not but i think you know the services always need to be individualized it's not necessarily an automatic denial of faith but it's yeah i think what we're i think the way we're framing this is to say that if you don't get exactly what you were entitled to brick and mortar and the district makes a good faith effort to provide these virtual services, but you know, appropriately tailored. In other words, everybody is getting group speech, right? Let's just put a hypothetical. Everybody in third grade is getting group speech because that's all the staff I have and we're just gonna do it that way virtually. I would take the position that's not, in, that's not tailored to the individual needs of the students. So, for our audience, the point we're trying to make here is don't do things in block, right? In, in, in grouping students, in, in, and I see shaking your head, Dana and Kendra. Um, that's where I know for staffing issues, and I know the realities of getting substitute teachers and all of that can make it easier. And I, I actually had a conversation today with a speech pathologist who was struggling with some of those issues. It can't be all or none. So the the point is it could be a denial of faith if it's viewed by the court that in fact you just said everybody gets this and you know tick the box the next so ladies chime in if you'd like that's the beauty of the remote learning plan i think that it is you know we in the beginning when we went to these remote learning plans in illinois people were like how am i going to do this this is going to be overwhelming we're going to be having hundreds of iep meetings but it really it doesn't have to be you know a 
a 20 page document or even a five page document. It can be some statements that explain how the remote learning is being individually tailored to meet that student's needs. And it's more like a tweaking of how we're gonna make this work for you as an individual and, and not that whole, like this is what we're giving because this is what we have staff for or this is what we have time in our day for. So just like to take a deeper dive in that from a logistical point of view, because I think Kendra, you mentioned you do it by amendment, right? So generally we start by amendment. And if the parent says, eh, I don't like that, I don't want it, then you have a meeting to talk about it and flesh it out. Perfect. And so one of the challenges with the large numbers of students in special ed in some of our districts, and I and I think you're exactly right, Dana, when you say the hesitation to do that is twofold. I have to now look at 1,500 students that are in special ed, have my case managers write something up. But I think as this goes on and on, it may be something people that are listening and watching want to consider. What if you can't get a consent? Because here, um, amendment to the IEP uh, without a meeting could be by written consent of the parent, but what if we can't get that written consent? And I think that's one of the challenges. We have such a diverse group of students that that is, um, even when some districts were seeking consent for uh, related services for telepractice, that was a real challenge to get the parent to respond. So how have you guys dealt with that challenge? Yeah, I know some of our bigger districts are also looking at, you know, prioritizing the ones where you know the IEP is written isn't going to be implemented and you're going to have an implementation failure if you don't get it amended. And so really prioritizing those kids and reaching out to those families. Um, and then for some of the others, like recognizing that this is going on for a long time, doing it as the annual IEP comes up, right? At that annual IEP meeting, work out this plan as well, incorporate it all into the IEP. Um, and then, you know, by the time we're done with this year, every single kid will have one. And if something like this happens again, or some other natural disaster or other reason that a student would have to be out for an extended period of time, you've already thought through some of those issues and it's ready to go. Well, I think that that's a really interesting idea at, because by then June 30th, every student will have had, right, an, mm -hmm. an annual view within a, a year cycle. Right. And I think um, one of the changes in education across the nation, if you guys, um, I know in Chicago, I, I've been there many times, the weather can be a little challenging, right? I heard about that polar vortex thing that scared me, but yeah. it would allow a school district to perhaps be home for a week and then turn on that remote learning. And we, we used to have, you know, more challenging winters here in New Jersey, but I'm wondering with a natural disaster like a Hurricane Sandy or something like that, that now we just implement the IEP per the remote learning plan. So I think the interesting thing is maybe to have one on deck as part of the IEP in the event you, the lights go off for whatever reason. So I, I think that's a really interesting idea. Yeah, you think about like all the situations that could arise. I know, I know we had some students relocate, um, or I had some students on my caseload that we re had relocated after Hurricane Katrina. And that was a period of time where kids were out of school for a long time, or you have kids that are sick. Maybe they're getting treatment for a you know, life-threatening illness and they can't come to school. It's, that's sort of the silver lining is it's given us a new way to reach kids that maybe we didn't have before. Mm -hmm. I agree. Let's try another one, Jackie. Yeah, I was gonna say this pulls into a very interesting um, factor fiction that we have here is whether or not it constitutes a change of placement when a student activates to provide uh, heads into remote instruction. So a change of placement occurs when a student with a disability is being provided remote instruction, factor fiction. And I think what I'm hearing from you is that it might depend on whether or not uh, it's already written into their IEP. So does someone want to take this? Well, I, I, I think there's an interesting legal piece here. Once you have, see, without a distance learning plan, I would take the position, at least now, and I think it's going to be decided, uh, we, here in New Jersey, it is not a change of placement. It's just literally a different way of providing education. Um, and here in New Jersey, students in some districts have the choice to be remote. So it's by choice. 
other districts you've been mandated to be home, right? So there's a lot of factors, but I'm wondering in Illinois, if there's an amendment to an IEP with a remote learning plan, if that does constitute a change of placement at that point, and how does that impact our state put? I mean, I'm throwing a lot of different Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just um, start by saying it's not, uh, we're not calling it a change in placement because it's something that happened. I mean, when we started this whole sort of remote learning plan process and changeover, it was because we were all ordered home. So I think under that fact pattern, it wouldn't be a change of placement. But Kendra, what do you think? There could probably be other fact patterns where maybe it would. Yeah, I think in general, the way, you know, in the current circumstances, I would say going remote is a change in circumstances, right? It's external to what's happening. And when we think about that FAPE standard, it's, you know, calculated so the student can make reasonable progress in light of their individual circumstances. And one of our circumstances here is it's not safe to be in the building. And so we need to be remote. And so thinking about that as, you know, sort of an external factor and not as an actual educational placement. And I agree. The OCR or OSEP guidance said that, you know, if the student is going to be remote, um, you know, for a temporary time during the pandemic, that we would not need to make a change of the placement on the IEP. And so that um, is helpful. We certainly have seen due process cases challenging and saying, this is a change of placement. I'm entitled to stay put and my stay put is in the school building with my peers and my teachers. Uh, and those are working their way, you know, through hearing officer decisions in courts, and we'll have to kind of see where it goes. Um, I think that creates a real problem if we get a bunch of decisions saying that that's a change in placement and a family has a right to stay put in the building. It's, it's that, sorry, that actually pulls into another fact of fiction we have here, which I think is where we're going to discuss is whether or not a parent can invoke stay put. It sounds like that is something that's being worked through the courts. What's your opinion? So there, there was a New York case that came out, I think it's just in September, about this, where the student was receiving instruction through the IEP at a library. We all go remote, the library closes, and the parents filed an emergent action to invoke stay put at the library um, because they worked and they, they could not be home while the student was home receiving services. And uh, the court found that, and again, they're, they're doing it on an emergent basis. So there's certain factors where irreparable harm and one that Kendra, you were speaking to with weighing the interests, the equities and the interests of the parties. And they had a way, you know, the parents interest in being able to still work versus the safety of a student, and the safety of others. And at the end of the day, that is what was the, the greater interest was safety. And the court found that the, the parent could not invoke state put for the location of the library and that the IEP could be implemented in the home. And I think that's where it's going to end up. I mean, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, New York, California, um, different states are going to handle these, these challenges. And they're also going to be very facts for specific, correct, right? If there, I think, an ability to provide perhaps in-person instruction in another manner, maybe that'll be, you know, maybe not in your particular school building, but you can contract that out or you can send that student who's really impaired, who just is not going to get any meaningful educational benefit from a remote learning environment. I could see the argument, but as a blanket uh, in a pandemic, health and safety in my mind, uh, are always going to be the final say of, of what is reasonable in that circumstance. And we here, as I'm sure you in Illinois, have to work with our Department of Health to make sure that whatever the school districts are doing are in line with what, um, so for example, as we face students back into the building, one of the challenges are, I want to bring in 50 kids, but I can't maintain social distancing or the CDC guidelines. So then my advice is, then you've got to eliminate the number of students to fit in within your CDC guidelines, right? We, it's just that ultimately is going to be the end. Um, and I think it's un, not going to be, um, it's going to be interesting to see if the courts follow that line of thinking, because saying I get to stay in a building when the building is closed for a world. It's not a New Jersey pandemic. It's not an Illinois pandemic. It is 
a worldwide pandemic. So, you know, but as things clean up in different parts of the state or different parts of the country are less COVID or, you know, more, you know, the Dakotas, other areas where they're more rural and you have more space, even in New Jersey and South Jersey, there are other uh, uh, school districts that are fully in person because they have the ability to abide by those CDC guidance in the way that some of us here in North Jersey can. So you guys want to chime in before we move on? No, that's just, I just think that's such an interesting, you raised earlier equity issues and, mm -hmm. you know, there's equity issues by, um, you know, how much money you have, but it's also sort of geographic, you know, the pandemic has raised some equity issues surrounding that and how much space people have. And, you know, even if you have money in some places, there's no way to get more space. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. Let's try another one, Jackie, before we wrap up. Sure, you wanna um, stay on FAPE or should we move on to another uh, area? I think there was something about related service providers, which I know we wanted to touch on and the ability, I think it's number 20. 25 or 27? Uh, I think 20, this about the SLPs, let's do that one. Okay, I had to figure out what else I meant. Um, all right, uh, this is an interesting one. A speech and language pathologist cannot provide services to a student if the child is located out of district during distance learning. That's a fun one. We actually had this situation last week, and I'll, I'll, I won't say how we came out, but the exact question was, parent, and we're in Illinois, so a lot of vacation homes are in Wisconsin, which... No offense to any lovers of Wisconsin, or you know, it's a bad area right now. It's on the bad list. It's on the naughty list for COVID. You're not supposed to go to Wisconsin necessarily. And it sort of goes off and on. So we had a, a family relocate to their vacation home in Wisconsin and um, from an Illinois school district and the speech pathologist was convinced that she could no longer help with the difference between S and Z and where to put your tongue for each because she would be violating um, her, she, she was not licensed and it would impl implicate her license and she would be at, at risk of losing her license to provide service over state lines, albeit remotely through you know Zoom or whatever the district was using. So that was the dilemma. How are you guys answering that dilemma? All right, so that's, that's interesting just to add another level to it because in New York, in New Jersey, sorry, I forgot which state I was in. In New Jersey, I know for a fact that when they suspended the telehealth um, requirements to permit telehealth in this state, regardless of uh, the requirements that were already built into the law, um, they did permit out of state practitioners to continue to provide services to um, patients they had in state. So I wonder um, if Illinois did something similar, which you could latch on to to potentially permit that, um, that in state, or if Wisconsin did something similar to permit that out of state services to be provided across state lines to an existing quote unquote patient in that case. Yeah. yeah. And that's actually what Illinois did do. There is in one of the gubernatorial orders declaring Illinois, you know, declaring a, a, a disaster and a state of emergency is they did said, say that if a patient that you're currently treating who is an Illinois resident, an Illinois permanent resident, relocates out of state, that you can continue to provide the service um, through telephonic or other um, technological means. Right, and so we definitely did a deeper dive in this as well, because we're seeing the same um, sort of concerns from licensed uh, related service providers. And so what we do know is you have to go back to your, so specifically for speech and language pathologists, you have ASHA who has guidance, right? And then in New Jersey, New Jersey ASA, um, we don't have a specific prohibition here under those organizations or any statute regulation that says if you are licensed in New Jersey as an SLP, you can only treat a student who is located in the state of New Jersey. However, in the state of Delaware and Alaska, they specifically have um, directives that you can only treat, uh, uh, provide speech and language services to a student uh, in 
your state in those two states. So to me, unless there's a, you know, Asha says, go back and look at what your state says. The state in New Jersey is saying, well, we don't have anything, but here are some recommendations and guidelines. So I do see where it could be confusing. But by analogy, states like Delaware and Alaska have a very explicit prohibition from being able to treat in an educational setting someone outside of the state. So I would take the legal position absent something clear cut like those two states. I think you are allowed to do it, especially in the educational setting during COVID. After that, I would expect your uh, licensing organizations or your professional organizations to provide more guidance. And here in New Jersey, as I said before, um, the Department of Education did not permit telepractice at all in August of 2019, and we had to really relax that. So the governor relaxed it for telehealth, the state relaxed in the educational setting. So I think you have to collectively look at all of that guidance as we are doing across all of these issues and make the most um, educated uh, guess based on our expertise and the legal guidance in front of us. And it, without a direct prohibition, I would say it's permissible at this point, here in New Jersey anyway. Um, and I would encourage for the um, school uh, uh, staff that's out there, please ask your board attorneys. That's what we're here for. We're having an exchange and you can see there's a lot of ways to um, peel back the layers on these issues. And so don't, don't, uh, don't do it alone. You know, call your board attorney and see because your board attorney will be up to speed on all of this. And we have the benefit of having friends over in Illinois that we can bounce ideas off of as well, right? Because um, we are st still kind of plowing forward and figuring this all out. Um, I think we're running out of time. So we can just go back to gallery view, Jackie. Mm -hmm. um, any final words from our guests um, from Illinois, from Chicago, Dana Crumley and uh, Kendra Yuck? Any so, final words? Yeah, so much fun to be with you all and just to have someone else to talk about these issues with. So thank you so much for including us in this. Yeah, thank you so much. We had a lot of fun and hopefully people watching uh, got some good new perspectives on things and feel like we are all in this together all across the country. So that's nice to know too. Agreed. Um, go ahead, Kaylin. Any final words, Jackie? Oh, no, no. It just, uh, again, just, it was very interesting hearing it from another perspective and just, and also comforting that you're, you're dealing with this too. And we, like you said, we're all in this together. Yeah. We're looking forward to continuing to work with everyone here and um, everyone out there, please reach out if you have questions and you need some assistance. We're here to assist you. Absolutely. So again, thank you all. Um, as it is, uh, the conference is in October and we are pre-recording this. I'm going to put my little lawyerly disclaimer <laughs> that everything we said today is what we know today. Um, this is a fluid situation. Um, don't come back and say, wait a minute, they said this. There could be today at five o'clock, Friday at five, right, ladies, is when they send out all this guidance. Oh, that's for sure. <laughs> So just my little loyally disclaimer. Thank you, thank you, Francic team. Thank you, uh, Florio Perucci. Thank you, New Jersey School Boards. It's an absolute pleasure. And I'm gonna say we're gonna do this in 2021, but in person, fingers crossed. Very good. Okay, take care, folks. I know. Bye. Thank you.